Good afternoon, all. Today, we are pleased to hear, welcome uh, Professor Carl Jones with us. And this session will be moderated by Dr. Alulika Sinha. Alulika, it's over to you. Hello. Is there an echo? Okay, it works, right? Okay, a very uh, good afternoon to everyone. And uh, thanks, Paragda, for the introduction. I am Alolika Sinha, a conservation biologist working with RNA. It's a matter of, uh, you know, a great pleasure and honor to have with us Professor Carl Jones for this uh, plenary talk on rewilding. In today's time, with unabated destruction of ecosystems and declining trend of most of the species, rewilding has indeed become necessary to safeguard the species, ecosystems, and at the same time ensure human well-being. And when it comes to rewilding, Professor Jones is a leading expert. He is a globally renowned conservationist who, in his own words, had decided uh, very early on in life that he wants to work for wildlife and conservation. He eventually went on to earn a master's degree and consequently a PhD from Swansea University, and he studied birds for his research thesis. He has been involved with the Dial Wildlife Conservation Trust since a long time, since 1985, and he continues to oversee the trust's work and is the thought leader and the chief scientist of the trust. He has done some incredible uh, uh, conservation work in Mauritius where he brought back two very threatened, critically endangered species, the Mauritius kestrel and parakeet from, uh, from extinction. He recovered the Mauritius uh, kestrel uh, for, from the population of as low as four individuals. And it's, it's, it's really a, a task in itself. His work has been he, instrumental in safeguarding and restoring plant and animal communities in the, uh, around the, uh, on the islands around Mauritius. Uh, Professor Kern, along with uh, late Gerald Darwell, initiated efforts to rebuild the entire ecosystems and remove uh, alien species uh, to safeguard the native biodiversity uh, on the islands around Mauritius. For his incredible conservation work, he was awarded with the highly esteemed Indiana Police Award in 2016. I would also uh, like to play a small video uh, on the work of uh, Professor Carl Jones. Uh, if I have the permission of the moderator, you know, to share the screen, am I good to go with the screen? Okay. So um, for our audience, I would like to play a video which, you know, in a nutshell puts uh, Professor Kurt's work. And here it goes. Uh, sorry for the pause. Just checking in. Is the is the both the audio and the video are, uh, are visible and audible respectively? Just checking in from the in-house people. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, sorry for the pause.
Mauritius is a paradise island. But it's just a Bermuda. is driving the restoration of
So uh, that was an initiative by the Volvo Cars, and that's Professor Jones for you. So before the stage is taken over by Professor Jones, I would like to state, uh, mention a very simple housekeeping rule that we have. Our uh, people joining us through Zoom uh, will be keep, keep, keep in muted mode and they can put their questions and queries in the chat box. And people joining us through live streaming session on Facebook or YouTube can put their feedback, question and queries in the comments section. At the end of uh, Professor's talk, we can take the questions. So I welcome Professor Jones and it's over to you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, sir, we can yes, hear you. Okay, right, I'm having a difficulty here. One second, let me just share the screen. Thank you very much. Okay, it's a great pleasure to be speaking you, to you today. And I'd like to thank Aranyak for inviting me and also to my dear friends, Parag and Ritterman. And it's a great pleasure to be telling you about the work that we do. I work for the Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust. And of course, we work very closely with you in the SAM and we are very proud of our relationship. And today I'm gonna to be talking about rewilding, but actually I'll be talking about some of the steps behind rewilding. So I'll, I will be talking about the pro process and progress in the restoration of endangered species. And of course the work that we do at the Durrell Wildlife Conservation Trust was originally started by Gerald Durrell. Gerald Durrell was an author and naturalist and he believed passionately that we could save the world's most endangered species. And that by working with endangered species, we could actually help restore whole ecosystems. And of course, he had a, a great interest in the pygmy hog going way back to the 1960s. And it is that work that you're doing on the pygmy hog, which is so important as a driver restoring the grasslands in Assam. Jerry was inspired by the ability to be able to take species and restore them. And he lamented the extinction of the dodo. The dodo was the first species to become extinct when we'd realized that we had caused its demise. And the dodo came from the island of Mauritius. Mauritius is in the Southwest Indian Ocean, and of course has very strong links with India. And it was on the island of Mauritius that Jerry Durrell thought, wouldn't it be lovely if we could set up a conservation program there in the land of the dodo? And so we started working in Mauritius in the mid 1970s. And Mauritius, of course, is associated with an extinction, the loss of the dodo. But Mauritius has also lost a lot of other species and there's been profound destruction. If we look at this woodcut, which dates from 1602, we can see it's the first illustration of Mauritius and it shows a lot of destruction going on. People are chopping down forests, they're setting up a settlement, they're taking fish out of the sea. And on the right hand side of this picture, you can see a dodo walking towards oblivion. And in the top left, you can actually see a picture of an echo parakeet, the Mauritius parakeet. And towards the middle, you can just make out a pink pigeon. So this is a very evocative illustration, the first ever illustration of Mauritius showing destruction, but also showing the richness of the then endemic wildlife. And if we look at maps of 
forest cover in Mauritius, it's no wonder that we lost the dodo. It's no wonder we've lost many other species. Because if you look at the map from 1773, you can see most of the island was covered in forest, which is represented in black. But by 1997, only 2% of the island had primary native forest left. We lament the loss of the forest, and Mauritius is an extreme example of habitat destruction. But it is not the only example. There are many places worldwide that show similar levels of destruction. And of course, as a result of that destruction, we've lost many species besides the dodo. And if we go clockwise around this picture, we can see the flightless red rail, the browsing tortoise, a blue pigeon, a lesser fruit bat, the raven pigeon, and a giant skink. All these species have been lost. But what we must realize is that we've lost not just individual species, but we've also lost their ecological functions. So this has meant that we're left with greatly impoverished ecosystems. However, I'm happy to say that there are still many remarkable species still around on Mauritius. And these are some of the species that I have been involved with during my career. Some endangered reptiles, plants, birds, and fruit bats. And when I went to Mauritius, in, the early, in my early 20s, I went there to work on the endangered species, but also to essentially close the project down. I'd been told by many conservation organizations that organizations. Uh, so I'm just beating in between. Yeah. Okay. Some okay. of the species that I have been involved with so, during my career. So can you please, can you tell me? Reptiles, plants, birds, and fruit bats. Wow. And when I went to Mauritius, in the early- Can you hear me, sir? It, I can hear you, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I went there to work on the endangered species, but also yeah. to- Sir, can you hear me? I can hear you well. Yes, I okay. Sir, so did you uh, share your screen? Organization. Okay, I, I'm just speaking in between. Sorry for that. But, uh, uh, so I'm just speaking. Um, thank you very much. I will, uh, shall I try again? Recorded version, Yeah, Professor Jones, can you hear me? I can hear you very well, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So sorry, sorry for you know stopping in between. So did you uh, share uh, the screen? We are unable to see anything. Oh, sorry. Shall I start again? Uh, well, you can you can continue from now. We have been listening to what you were saying. We okay, thought I'm, that I'm, very, you were... I'm really sorry, but um, hang on a minute. Let me see whether I can uh, get my screen back up again. Can you see my screen now? Well, it's coming. Yes, now we can see your screen. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, let me just see. 
OK, I'll go very quickly through some of those original slides and I'll carry on the story for where I got to. Can you hear me now? Yes, you can do it, sir. Thank you very much. Jerry Durrell, interest in the dodo, work on the island of Mauritius. Sir, can you Early... please put it in a presentation mode or you can, you know, zoom out uh, uh, the slides? Yes, yeah, so you can put it in the presentation mode, sir, the slide shows. It's it's just in, at the uh, bottom of the line, well, the slideshow. Yeah. Yes, I can see. I okay. Okay. It's. It's yet to appear in the slideshow. Yeah, I think. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um... <sighs> Can you see anything? So we, we see the entire, uh, you know, entire pan of the slides. You can see all your slides all together. Can you please? Okay, well, I'm sorry about that, but um, it's not seeming to respond. Okay, okay. Um, what shall I do? Uh, hang on a minute. Let me just see whether I can. Uh, let me go out and come back in. Is that all right? Yes, yes, So can you hear us now? Sir, am I audible to you, John, sir? Yes. 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 Yeah. Sir, can you hear us? Sir, you need... So are you muted? We cannot hear you. He has been putting mute again. Of course. Okay. Sorry to keep you waiting and all the glitches. Can you hear us, sir? So you are speaking, but I think you, you're not audible. He's not in the meeting. He is in the meeting. 
John, sir, can you hear us? My microphone is not working. Okay. He, he just sent a message. Yeah. Sir, oh, can you please rejoin? Leave the meeting and join, join again. No, no, his microphone is not working, it seems. He just sent in a message. Oh, there's a good flow. Down nine again. He's not there. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Sorry for the glitches and you know breaking your flow. <laughs> we are extremely sorry about <laughs> it. No problem at all. Uh, these things happen. Let me see. Um, now then. Yeah. Can you see my talk? Yes, we can. Process and progress in the restoration of endangered species. I will rush through these first slides quite quickly. Okay, I'm gonna talk about the whole process of restoring species and how that drives the restoration of ecosystems. The work was started by Gerald Durrell, the author and naturalist who had a great interest in critically endangered species. And he was inspired by the work that we could do to save endangered species. And he lamented the loss of the dodo, which had disappeared in 1662. And he long wanted to work on the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. Mauritius, off the southwest coast of Africa, southeast coast of Africa, sorry, uh, was very famous because it had lost the dodo, but also a whole host of other species. And if we actually look at the early illustrations of Mauritius, it is small wonder that the dodo was lost. The first ever illustration of the island shows people destroying the forest and taking fish out of the sea and utilizing the natural resources. We can see a dodo walking off the right hand side of this illustration. The forest was quickly destroyed. The black areas show the area of forest. And in 1773, there was still a lot of forest left on the island, but by 1997, we only had 2% left. The dodo disappeared, but also a whole host of other species. The red rail, which is a flightless bird. The browsing tortoise, the blue pigeon, the lesser fruit bat, the raven parrot and the giant skink all disappeared. But fortunately, there are still some amazing creatures left on Mauritius. Reptiles, plants, birds and fruit bats. And these are the species that I've been working with. I went to Mauritius in my early 20s. I went there to work on the critically endangered species, but also to essentially closed down the project. I was told by the international conservation organizations that I was to hand the program over to the local people. And although, of course, they wanted to do the best job they could, they had neither the resources nor the expertise in those days to conserve the species. So many species, want, so many people wanted to withdraw from Mauritius because they felt that many of the critically endangered species that still existed had little chance of surviving. The first species that I started to get involved with was the Mauritius kestrel. In 1974, it had declined to just four individuals in the wild. And this was a feeling which many people held. 
This is a famous book that was written in 1979 by Norman Myers, who was, a, who was and is a famous conservation biologist. And he wrote in The Sinking Ark, we might abandon the Mauritius Kestrel to its all but inevitable fate and utilize the funds to proffer stronger support for any of the hundreds of threatened bird species that are more likely to survive. He was essentially saying we shouldn't work with endangered species because we can't save them anyway. But of course, Gerald Durrell didn't believe that. And as a young man, I didn't believe it either. So I started to work on the Mauritius Kestrel. And there were only two breeding pairs left in the world. And I harvested the eggs from the wild nests and this encouraged them to lay more eggs. And the eggs that I harvested I hatched and reared in captivity and used those to establish a captive population. And eventually I was able to breed a number of kestrels in captivity and use those young to restore the wild population. And when we released birds into the wild, we started to manage them closely, to look after them, to nurture them. And over a number of years, we were able to reverse the decline. We did captive breeding and reintroduction and reintroduced 333 birds. And we supported those birds by providing them with nest boxes and some supplemental feeding, and also by controlling predators around the nest. And the population has increased. And although it still requires a lot of work, we do today have about 200 to 350 birds. The work with the Mauritius kestrel encouraged us to work on other species. And we started to work on the pink pigeon. The pink pigeon was also critically endangered and the population declined dramatically before 1990. There was a long-term declining numbers due in part to the effects of tropical storms, cyclones, which caused high mortality. However, the population could recover after storms, but there was still a problem with accelerated habitat destruction. So that by 1990, we only had nine or 10 wild birds left. We were fortunate that we had some captive birds and we used those birds to, to establish them in captivity and to breed them. And over a number of years, we were able to breed a large number of birds. Extinction had been predicted by 2001. However, we were able to reverse the downward trend by captive breeding and reintroduction. We have established eight subpopulations. And we now, in 2021, have 500 free living birds. The birds are doing well in the remaining forests of Mauritius, but they still need some long-term care. They need supplemental feeding. We need to control introduced predators such as introduced cats and mongooses, and we have to do some disease management. But at least we have saved the species from almost certain extinction. So we were able to save the kestrel and the pigeon, and this encouraged us to work with the echo parakeet. You'll recognize it as being closely related to your rose ringed or ring necked parakeet, which is common in India. But this is actually an island endemic species. And it declined to a very, very small population. And field work in the 1980s demonstrated that it declined to just eight to 12 birds. We looked at its ecological history to try and understand why the population had declined. And we studied what nesting attempts there were. We provided nest boxes because we assumed there was a shortage of natural nesting holes. And we provided some supplemental food and we looked at diseases to see whether there were disease issues. Our ecological history showed that the population had declined dramatically with the destruction of forest. We estimated that on pristine Mauritius, they would have been in the region of maybe 18 or 20,000 birds. 
But by the time I started working on it, we just had two or three nesting pairs. We visited all nest sites. We found that it was poor breeding success. There were seasonal food shortages and tropical nest flies parasitized and killed the chicks. So we started to work on the wild nests by modifying them. We provided nest boxes, improved natural sites by weatherproofing them, predator proofing them, changing the depth and altering them so we could inspect the nest sites easily to change the substrate and also to treat the nest sites so we could kill parasites. We soon found that some pairs were nesting, but the chicks were failing. So we monitored the weight and development of the chicks and any chicks that we saw that were losing weight, we would harvest. We would bring them into captivity for, capti for captive rearing. And we rescued many of these failing chicks and used them to establish a captive breeding program. And later, we rescued chicks and started releasing them to the wild. And over a period of six years, between 1999 and 2005, we released 139 birds. These we were derived from harvested eggs and young, and also from captive bred young. And we released them as young as possible, since we felt that it was important that they went through their periods of early learning in the wild. And we supported those young birds by feeding them, controlling predators, and making sure that they had all the things that they required. And our first year survival was just short of about 90%, which is quite remarkable. And the population started to grow. So from eight to 12, wild birds known in the late 1980s with intensive management of the wild population, we now have more than 750 free living birds. But again, there is a need for long-term nest site management and some supplemental feeding. When you look at what we've done, what we've been doing is to try and understand limiting factors. Why are populations becoming so endangered? And we look at the work of David Lack, who was a, a British ecologist who showed that the populations of all vertebrates were controlled by a small number of variables, food, predators, competitors, disease, and breeding sites. Not all of these factors, of course, are in operation, but a combination of these. But we can mit mitigate these by, if there's food shortage, providing supplementary food. If there are predators, controlling them. If there's disease, controlling them, controlling it. And if there are shortages of breeding sites, certainly for our birds, we can provide some nest sites. And this is what we did. And as a result of this, we saw that the population of our birds grew rapidly. And you can see here the increase in the numbers of kestrel, pink pigeon, and echo parakeet. And, you know, I'm very proud of this graph because it shows the recovery of those three species. But what's interesting is that it did, did take two or three decades of intensive work before the population started to recover. But what is interesting is that the techniques that worked on the kestrel also worked on pigeons and parrots, understanding limiting factors and mitigating those. But these techniques have worked on a whole range of species. And in the last 40 years, we have reversed the declines of a whole range of species and saved from possible or probable extinction, five species of birds, three species of reptiles and a fruit bat as well as innumerable plants. And these are just some of the bird species that have recovered or are recovering. Mauritius fodi, the Rodrigues brush warbler, the pink pigeon, the Mauritius kestrel, the olive white guy, the Rodrigues fodi and the echo parakeet. But to actually achieve this, we've had to apply long-term minimum management. 
which we need to put in place for many critically endangered species and in nece is necessary while habitats are compromised. We have to do apply captive management techniques applied to wild and free living populations. But this is far better than captivity. And the animals we've released and are still managing are still fulfilling ecological roles and under, under natural selection. But what is more important is that by restoring these species, we have been driving the restoration of ecosystems. The work on these species has resulted in setting up national parks, restoring the native forest, and also in restoring small offshore islands where there are also many critically endangered species. And the island of Round Island is one of the islands that we have been restoring. Round Island suffered really badly from introduced rabbits and goats that caused the destruction of the native forest and caused widespread soil erosion. As, as you can see, in the late 1970s and 1980s, the island was basically just a rock. And this is one of the areas of best vegetation where we have a dying palm savanna and some vestiges of tussock grasses, which you can see in the foreground. However, we removed the exotic mammals. We removed goats in 1976 to 79. And in 1986, we hired a group of New Zealanders, which you can see on the left there, and they were able to get all the rabbits by shooting and poisoning. And as a result of eradicating the rabbits, the island has started to recover. You can see the top picture shows the island as it was. And one year later, a picture taken from the same spot shows rapid regeneration of native plants, but also rapid invasion of exotic plants. These exotic plants have proven difficult to control. And so what we have done is we have set up a field station on the island. And we decided that we needed to control the exotic plants and to restore native plants. And this is what we've been doing. Initially, we started replacing species that once thought to be there. We grew seeds in a nursery. We took plants across and head started them in our field nursery. And in 2001, we did a modest first year planting of 1500 plants. However, one year later. Uh, yeah, sir, sorry to interrupt again. I'm really sorry. You know, you, you need to bring the cursor down. We're not able to see the slides. So we can see slide one to 35 at one go. You can just bring the cursor down and we will be able to see the other slides that you're talking about. I'm sorry, but uh, it seems to be Even you can continue, you know, we were, we were enjoying the talk anyway, so you can continue even with the I'm, so, I'm sorry about to. that, but it, uh, it seems to show that I'm sharing it quite well here. Yeah. Oh. Um, oh, gosh, let me go back and see what I can do. Yeah, otherwise we're still good with your, with your narration, sir. It's okay, very thank engaging. you very much. I'm, I'm sorry about the problems we're having here. Um, but essentially, we, we restored the fee. Um, we start tried to restore the plants, but discovered that mortality was exceedingly high. And so we decided we had to do something about it. And hang on a minute. So we had to build a water catchment. We decided that if the plants were going to survive on the island, that they had to be managed. So we built a water catchment and started to look after the plants. However, we found that there was an additional problem that uh, 
Let me just try a new screen sharing. Is that better? Yes. Yes, yes. Can you see the birds? Yes, the, the borrowing bird problem. We can see that slide. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. We planted, uh, we um, planted plants out. The problem was that the, the birds are digging them up. So we then decided that we had to do something about it. And the botanist said, well, it's very easy. You just get rid of the birds. And we said, no, you can't get rid of the birds. We're trying to restore whole ecosystems. So what we did, hang on, this isn't responding. So what we did was we actually had to plant out the uh, plants and then protect them. Excuse me a section, second, I'm gonna to have to go back into this again because it's not, it's just not working. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Can you see the plant in the, in the cage? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so what we did was we, put plants out and we put small cages around them and we managed the plants in the cages. So it provided a microclimate and the plants started to do really well. And we started to garden the plants on the island. And since 2003, we've been watering and weeding the seedlings and watering weekly until the rainy seasons come. And as a result of this care, survival to one year has now gone up to about two thirds. And after a year, the plants seem to do really well. And so by looking after the plants in the first year, we were able to establish a forest on the island, weeding and replanting a Mauritian forest. And the vegetation has returned and provided a home for the native reptiles. And as you can see, in 1972, there was very little forest left, by, but by 2015, we had a wonderful forest of palms and hardwoods that were recovering. However, some plants have declined. Some of the tussock grasses had declined, and many of the understory plants had actually declined. And this was because we felt that they were being shaded out by the palms and the hardwoods that had recovered. And we did some, some historic research that showed that on the island originally, they would have been tortoises and these would have acted as grazers and they would have kept the understory open. And we had to put back a grazer, but the grazer that was there was now extinct. The tortoises of Mauritius had long since disappeared. So we decided to put back a species to try and re restore the ecological functions of the extinct tortoises. The extinct tortoises would have been grazers and tramplers, browsers and seed dispersers. So we needed to think of an ecological replacement. So we did a pilot study by putting tortoises on a small island off Mauritius. We put our Dabra tortoises there and they started to eat the fallen fruits of the endemic ebony. This ebony was very rare and wasn't regenerating. And we soon found that our introduced tortoises started to eat the fallen fruits and spread the seeds in their droppings. And after a few weeks, we found that the seeds would miraculously start to germinate. And we started to see the germination of young ebony trees, something which hadn't been seen in over a century. And we soon started seeing young ebony trees growing up well away from the adult trees. The adult trees are represented here by the dark spots and the light blue spots are showing the young regenerating trees. 
And so we started to see the re regeneration of a native forest. And when we started looking at regeneration, or should I say germination rate of our seeds, we saw that those that had passed through the gut of an Aldabran tortoise germinated and grew much more quickly than those that were just planted in a nursery. So this was gave good empirical evidence to show that by using an exotic species, we could restore the ecological function of an extinct species. So we took back tortoises to Round Island. This was done a decade ago. We took the tortoises across by helicopter. We introduced them onto the island. The tortoises have since been controlling the exotic vegetation by grazing it. And they have been spreading the seeds of some of the native plants. And we are seeing the restoration of a native vegetation, grazing vegetation climax. We are seeing lots of the native plants being restored. So this is the first step in the restoration of a badly damaged ecosystem. Unfortunately, as you know, Mauritius has lost many species have become extinct. And we are now thinking that in the future, we can bring back other replacement species to replace the browsing tortoise. There is a tortoise that still exists, exists on the Galapagos Islands that we can bring across to replace our browsing tortoise. To replace the flightless rail, there are flightless rails that still exist elsewhere in the world, including one on the island of Aldabra, which we can bring back. And the extinct masculine booby, this large seabird on the right, which disappeared in the 1830s and 40s, there is a species on Christmas Island north of Australia called the Abbot's booby, which is very closely related that we can bring back. <clears throat> so we see that even when systems have been radically altered, there are possibilities for bringing back ecological replacements and rebuilding systems. These systems not, may not be like the ones that have been lost. They may have novel elements, but they will help ensure the survival of the maximum amount of biodiversity. So in this era, when we are losing lots of species, there is still great hope for restoring ecosystems. When you still have all the elements like you do in Assam, you can restore them. And in future years, we in Durrell look forward to working with you to help to restore the grasslands of Assam to ensure that pygmy hogs thrive and the grasslands can be restored. So we think there is great hope for the future and that conservation does work, that we can save species, but it takes decades. Just as the work that has been done on the pygmy hog started in the 1960s and is still continuing to this day, but is after several decades now bearing fruit work on the restoration of ecosystems can and does work, but possibly will take centuries. But that's no excuse for not starting and doing the work now. The world has many challenges, such as climate change and anthropogenic change. But as conservationists, we must be, optimist, we must be optimists and realize that in the future, we will, will be rebuilding whole ecosystems. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. That was indeed a wonderful uh, and engrossing uh, talk. You know, uh, the showcase of your work, how saving five species of birds, three species of reptile and a mammalian species had a rippling effect. And you know, it in turn went on to uh, creation of the national park and restore on habitat. So, your work is really inspiring and encouraging. 
particularly, I, I work on the grasslands in Manas and I work on hog deer. So your, your work has really, you know, put a sense of uh, achievement and a hope, I would say, a hope that we can continue the work. So, and thank you. It's, it's, it was really an honor to listen to you. So I open the session uh, for question and answer. And I would like to have, I ask you something. So I begin the question and the session with me. So, so you mentioned about, uh, you know, um, ecological replacement, where you have brought in uh, a, a species of turtle uh, to, as a ecological re uh, replacement. So I would like to ask, how do you select the species? Are there any chances that when you bring in an uh, ecological replacement as a species that can turn invasive and have uh, an negative impact on the native biodiversity? Yes, you're perfectly correct. That is a major problem that we have to consider. And before we put the Aldabra tortoises on Round Island, we did a, a 20 years of study looking at the species in enclosures, looking at its morphology, trying to find out as much as we could about the extinct tortoises and how they would have lived, and then doing some very careful studies. And of course, working with tortoises, if it went wrong, we could easily take them off. Um, and of course, you know, we're not suggesting for one moment that we should look for species to replace all the extinct species. We're just saying that in some cases, this type of approach can be really useful to bring back browsers or herbivores or, you know, apex predators. But we have to, of course, be very, very careful about it. But always saying that there are some avenues of hope when species have been lost. We're not saying it's going to work in every case. Thank you. Thank you for it. So we have uh, another a question from uh, Dr. Jimmy Bora. So Dr. Jimmy works with us and he asks uh, that both rewilding and restoration are massive activities in scale in terms of time and efforts. How do you suggest we get attention of investors to fund long-term projects where there is a possibility of, you know, 50-50 chances of a failure or success? Uh, the chances of success, I think, are much higher than 50-50. But you've always got to realize that what you are building may not be exactly the same as what has been lost because the world has changed so, so much. And yes, it's going to be very difficult to get long term funders to put a huge amount of money in at the beginning. But what you have to do is what you are doing now is work with species and slowly work up. And from your successes, use those as a springboard for being more and more ambitious. I know that the work that you are doing, restoring the grassland, is showing the way forward. In the modest work that you are doing, restoring grasslands, putting back pygmy hogs, is showing incrementally how to restore the systems. So once you have worked out the techniques, you can scale it up. There is no silver bullet. There is no magic wand. You're not going to get all the answers overnight. So you have to start modestly. You start modestly but have bold visions for the future. Think about what you can do in a hundred years time and go for it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think that answers Jimmy's question. So we have another question from Miss Ivy. She's a young researcher again working in Manas landscape. First, she, uh, you know, uh, she is thankful that for such a wonderful talk that you've just given. And she asks, that how do you predict about the current flight of helmeted hornbills, and are we doing enough to save it, save them? Um, I don't know about helmeted hornbills, but I can tell you that I have some very dear friends that work on hornbills. Um, Alan Kemp, who is a South African uh, expert on hornbills, and his daughter, they've for many years been working on the ground hornbill developing techniques, and I know that hornbill workers worldwide have come up with lots of techniques for working with species. There is no easy answer when you're working with a species such as the helmeted hornbill, but if you work with it long enough and understand its issues and understand its problems, you can start finding solutions. There is no quick answer, 
But the most important thing you can do is get to know your species and understand its problems, and then to slowly incrementally work through those problems and try and find solutions. I don't know what the answer is for the helmeted hornbill, but I can assure you there are answers for its conservation. And I'm hoping in the next few years to come to a SAM. And I hope that I'll be able to see the helmeted hornbill and some of your other species and be inspired. Uh, and I hope I can get inspiration from you and see how we can actually move forward with some of these species. But always remember, there are answers to all these problems. They may, may not seem the most obvious answers, but you'll find that eventually you can find a solution. It may be a compromise solution, but you can find solutions to save species and rebuild systems. Thank you. Uh, thank you for such an elaborate answer, sir. So we have another question from again a young uh, fellow from RNF. He's Pranav and he asks you that whether coexistence and re rewilding can be harmonized in your observation. Like what observation? Um, I think it's got to be. And I, I think what we're moving towards is rebuilding systems um, for the wildlife but also for the modern world. You know, we, we've got to take into account how the world is changing with climate change and so on, and also accommodating human beings in that system. I don't know what the answers are, but I'm sure they're there. And that's something we have to think about in the future. I think that one of the big problems that we have in conservation biology is that everybody has until very recently been thinking that we can turn the clock back, we can restore systems as, as they once were. And yes, in some cases we can do that and we should do it, but in many others we have to think about novel systems and compromise systems. But we must always be thinking about saving the maximum biodiversity or all the biodiversity that we can. So I don't have the answer to that, but I'm sure there are solutions that we can find. So be positive and think about what we can achieve rather than dwelling on all the problems all the time. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your take on this. So we have another question from Dr. Dipankar Lahakar. He is again working in Manas landscape on big cats. And he asks you, what are the rewilding challenges even after successful conservation breeding program? Um, the rewilding challenges are how do we actually use species to help drive rewilding? And th this is an, another take on, on an early question. But I really believe that when we work on one species, whether it be a helmeted hornbill or a pygmy hog, it gets people excited. They start understanding that we can save species. And then they start understanding that those species need complex systems. And by actually reintroducing pygmy hogs, we start to understand a lot more about grasslands and grassland function. And it helps us drive the restoration. So although I can't give you a definitive answer, I really think that conservation breeding programs are essential for helping us focus on what the real problems are when we are rebuilding systems. And rewilding is one of these terms which still has to be properly defined. What are we trying to do? I think what we're trying to do is to restore functional systems that in the end will start to look after themselves. And we, you know, to actually achieve that, we've got a long way to go and a lot of learning that needs to be done. And the next century is going to actually put forward a whole load of challenges, but I think we can meet those challenges and we can restore vibrant ecosystems with large cats, with your tigers, with your one-horned rhinoceros, with your hog deer, with your pygmy hogs, and with your grasslands. It's all doable. But we have to really understand how those systems work and think about how we can manage them and help them adapt and change in a changing world. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. So we have another question from the young lady again, 
who works on wildlife crime and she poses the question on the same she wants to know whether species restoration and recovery in today's time is more difficult with the increasing wildlife crime and how do you think we can work around it okay i think wildlife crime is a huge challenge worldwide but I, i've been listening to some of the the talks that we had today and they were really very very interesting and i was very encouraged to see that you're actually meeting some of the challenges while yes you've still got huge problems you're using lots of novel techniques such as dna and so on and if we actually look at europe where we have a wildlife crime problem and that was really very severe in the past it seems to be far less these days than it was because of control over importation because of better policing and so on so although i think we'll always have wildlife crime we are learning how to control it so i think there is great hope and i hope that in the future you will be able to control wildlife crime in your country by using novel techniques thank you thank you sir so we have uh, another question from dr jimmy bora where he mentions that given your vast experience uh, in working in different species across the countries what do you think uh, restrict the conservationists and the policy makers to think loudly and why are we failing to save the you know the better known species like the orangutans and the whales or the lesser known species and so what is your observation or take on this sir that is a tremendous tremendous question and it's one that's uh, not an easy one to answer of course we are still seeing lots of destruction in indonesia and we're seeing problems with orangutans but we're also seeing rays of hope and for many species of whales for example we have seen recovery of some species in recent years so while we are seeing huge declines in many parts of the world we are seeing recovery in others and i think we have to embrace those successful cases and use them to inform us on how we can actually work with many other species yes there are grave problems facing us all problems of climate change overpopulation pollution anthropogenic change however there are glimmers of hope and as conservationists we have to embrace those glimmers of hope and to move forward not to be despondent but to do what we can when we can so the work that you are doing in the manus national park the work you are doing on the grasslands the work you are doing with with your one horned rhinos with your hog deer with your pygmy hogs is showing the rest of the world that we can move forward we can achieve great things even when there are massive challenges so yeah. so we i think we'll take last two questions you have been continuously speaking so it must be tiring <laughs> so there's a question from one of our media uh, communication expert in at rnet and uh, he has put the question on youtube live and he asks you like whether animal agriculture fuels species extinction you know how you rearing and uh, of animals and you need space for that so how does that fuel species extinction um i didn't quite get the question but i i'll answer i'll answer the question i think that was talked about when we are saving individual species within conservation biology there's been a debate for for many years do we put the resources into restoring systems and preserving whole systems or do we save individual species and actually i believe that those questions are redundant or the, for the simple reason that when you work with species you actually drive the restoration of whole systems so we shouldn't be thinking of them as separate but as a part of a continuum the whole thing and as i pointed out in my talk we started with species and now we are rebuilding whole systems and by using those species we are understanding the multiple drivers of extinction and learning how to correct them 
Thank you. Thank you for your elaboration, sir. So this is one last question. This is from Dr. Vidut Bikash Sharma, <coughs> working in Assam. And he wants to ask you that, how do we prioritize between species uh, recovery or habitat restoration, given there are multiple drivers causing the damage? So how do we prioritize? I think I've already answered that. And that is they put, they're both uh, part of the same, same process. You, one drives the other and you're doing them both together, but you're using pygmy hogs to drive restoration of grasslands. So instead of thinking of them as separate, thinking, think of them both as part of the same solution. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you for those elaboration. I think with this, we close the question and answer session. And uh, it was wonderful to listen to you. We look forward to meet you sometime in Assam soon. And uh, I, I hand over to Dr. Parag. So he is the one who facilitated this talk and we are really thankful to him as well. Thank so you very much. Yeah. I'm sorry Thank about you. the Thank technical you. problems. No, no, I'm sorry about interrupting you all the time. <laughs> I had to do it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, it was a wonderful talk. So over to Dr. Parag Deka. Thank you, Carl, for joining us. This is Hi, Parag. This is nice to see you. <laughs> yes. Good to see you after many days. Uh, this is a wonderful talk, and it's really inspiring to all the young ecologists or biologists uh, working in Assam. And hopefully, they will take the message from your talk about how you go ahead with the species and the habitat, and they'll be inspired by you and take projects to. Uh, continue their work for long term. It was really the long term as you spend your entire life working in Mauritius and really able to save few species. I think okay, that's, that's the message young thank people need to take forward. Thank and you very thank you for giving us a wonderful talk. Thank you very much, Parag. And I'd like to finish by saying that I intend to come to Assam one day and I will gladly, gladly give a talk in person. And then hopefully we won't have all these technical problems. And I really want to come and meet you all because I've heard so much about the work you're doing that it's an inspiration to the rest of the world. And we are the people that are showing the way forward in the future. So go on and restore those grasslands and all those wonderful species that exist there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye, Carl. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.